where players who put their life on hold or some people were dropping out of school. The one thing Blizzard shouldn't have done was pull the plug. In 2019, analysts and game publishers began announcing to anyone who would listen that esports were a billion dollar industry. You would see reports that would put the valuation of esports just like through the roof. Winner of this match already guaranteed one million dollars. The minute its backers stop believing that, then what you have is a bubble and it will begin to explode. The position is theirs, the game is theirs, and top six is theirs! People have been playing games since the prehistoric days. And somewhere along the lines, we realize that not only do we like playing games, we like watching other people play especially when they're really, really good at it. So it makes sense that eventually we do to video games what we do to every other game, try and make money off of it. Welcome to the World Championship! But where what we now call eSports are different from the older and more established sports is that it's notoriously unstable. The entire industry seems to constantly be teetering on the brink of disaster, only to keep bouncing back, somehow promising more money every time. In this episode of Reset, we're getting into the economics of esports and taking a look at whether an industry that's valued to be a billion dollars lives up to the hype. We'll also look at where that money comes from and who's getting left behind. It was beautiful. It was action filled. And boy, what a race. Esports have a longer history than a lot of people might realize, but that history is a little hard to define. Las Vegas has hosted some big fights lately, but nothing holds a joystick to the Nintendo World Championship. Broadly speaking, we could talk about how the arcade boom started competitions in the 80s. Well, I thought I was doomed right before the Frogger, but then everyone choked. And how the home console revolution brought us into the 90s, competing not just in the arcades, but at home too. And then how the internet took all that worldwide. But if we're gonna talk about specific moments that brought esports to where they are now, there's a few moments that stand out. One of the first happened in 1997 with a tournament for the first person shooter, Quake. The Red Annihilation Quake tournament is interesting because it isn't remembered very much for the event itself. Not many people actually saw the games that were played. But what makes that tournament interesting is that it gives us our first esports champion in some ways. Dennis Thresh Fong. Thresh was hands down one of the best Quake players of his era. And it was at Red Annihilation, one of the first nationwide tournaments where gamers flew in from across the US to compete, where Thresh became the first esports pro with a truly recognizable name among gamers. And I think for a lot of people who were part of games culture back then, the idea that Thresh was able to do this immediately recast how you regarded skill at games like Quake that instead of it just being a thing where you could maybe be the best of your group of friends, that suddenly you could compare yourself to people playing Quake around the world. Quake may have given us a glimpse of what was coming, but that was nothing compared to what happened next with the explosion of the sci-fi strategy franchise StarCraft in South Korea. That is the place where you can start to see esports as a top-level competitive event and almost a pastime begin to come into focus. StarCraft was a popular game all over the world, but in Korea, it was a phenomenon. So your next question might be, well, why Korea? Well, it's complicated. But one factor was the government. Back in 97, a huge recession hit all of East Asia, meaning that buying a tricked out gaming PC wasn't necessarily on the table for everyone. But the Korean government had already been investing in high-speed internet for years, opening the way for a new kind of hangout spot that was perfect for the gamer on the budget, the cyber cafe, or as it's known in Korea, the PC bomb. These were communal spaces where people could play games on computers that were connected via LAN and also connected to a very good broadband internet infrastructure. And because people were playing on shared PCs, 
one of the things that determined whether or not a game stayed popular was just what did people like to play? And StarCraft was one of those games. As StarCraft's popularity and accessibility grew, gamers got better and better, and the competitions moved from the PC bombs to the arenas. And this was all happening at a time when the economy had started to bounce back, and people with money were looking to buy in. If you look at the heyday of StarCraft, what you find a lot of times are massive Korean corporations bankrolling these competitions, in part because they are looking for outlets to spend marketing money. The hype around StarCraft in South Korea had proven that video games couldn't just fill a local internet cafe, but it could pack stadiums with tens of thousands of screaming fans. Korean leagues sprouted overnight and started broadcasting on national television. And television execs back in the US were paying attention. They set their sights on Counter-Strike, a multiplayer first-person shooter that was already drawing not just American, but a lot of European gamers to competitions around the world, with prize pools around $100,000. From the Dell Gaming Arena, it's Counter-Strike Source. In 2006, DirecTV launched the Championship Gaming Series, which aired over its own channel and featured its own league of international esports teams. Their Counter-Strike tournaments had prize pools of over a million dollars. CGS was the first serious attempt to create a regular competitive gaming broadcast product. And the notion that you would have these things being broadcast like football, like hockey, like basketball, on television was incredibly exciting and it completely changed what people thought might be possible for the future of esports. DirecTV sunk $50 million into the esports project. They created an international league, hosted expensive player drafts, produced flashy broadcasts, and even committed to millions of dollars in player salaries and bonuses. This kind of stuff was normal in traditional sports like football and baseball, but it was unheard of for people playing a computer game. But as the money flew out the door, CGS self-destructed. Whether or not that was successful, I think you can judge from the fact that it was canceled after two years. But I think the more pernicious thing about it was that when CGS was finally wrapped up, a lot of these players had been pulled out of the more organic Counter-Strike scene and had a very hard time making their way back. There are a lot of reasons why CGS imploded, but the truth is the higher-ups at DirecTV didn't know a whole lot about esports, and they soon found out that they were in over their heads. They spent money way faster than they could make it, and CGS ended up being a cautionary tale as one of the first big bubbles to burst in esports. T.L. Taylor studies the culture and economics of esports. I remember when CGS folded and, um, you know, some people, of course, saw the writing on the wall, but it really, it was both an uh, economic blow, but it was also an organizational and a morale blow. And very importantly, though, it gutted the way the um, industry had previously been organizing itself around these third-party teams, third-party broadcast organizations. The failure of CGS set back the esports scene in North America, and a lot of the investor money evaporated with it. But the foundations and the lessons of the industry had already been growing for a decade. So in 2010, when StarCraft II was released with a new set of broadcasting tools, at the same time that Justin.TV, the predecessor to Twitch, was beginning to invest more heavily in gaming content, the stage was set for the next incarnation of esports. Live streaming didn't just expand the audience, but it made it easier for esports organizers and producers to really start thinking about audiences that could be packaged and sold to sponsors and advertisers in ways that they quite hadn't before. By the early 2010s, esports was on a trajectory that was impossible to ignore. Tournaments were being streamed by hundreds of thousands of people, and the industry's estimated value was over a hundred million dollars. In 2019, analysts and game publishers started announcing to anyone who would listen that esports were a billion dollar industry. There's no denying that the industry has exploded. 134 million views of esports events in 2012 more than doubled in 2016 and more than tripled in 2020. For a lot of investors, it's hard to resist reported revenue figures that almost quintupled in five years. So what exactly are people investing in? 
well, mostly tournament organizers like ESL and Major League Gaming, or teams like Fanatics and Dignitas. There it is, Nexus turret's gone. With the rise of live streaming and this sudden expansion of the audience, I think you get a lot of people coming into the esports space that weren't there before. And that ranges from investors, some of whom want to make long-term bets, investing in an esports team that they hope will one day have the status of the New York Yankees, right? More people watch the League of Legends World Championship than watch the BCS National Championship game. You also get short-term investors who are almost seeing esports in a startup model where there's kind of orgs to be built quickly and then sold off. And whereas game companies used to pretty much ignore esports, now the publishers of popular games like Overwatch and League of Legends actively encourage competitive gaming in leagues. Similar to a traditional sports league, it costs money to start an official team, and a yearly fee after that. The cost to entry is cheaper than a traditional sports team, but then again, there are some limitations. What are you telling an esports organization that's different from what you're telling, say, somebody who's in the NFL? The biggest, most substantial difference is nobody owns the game of basketball. Right? Like nobody owns the intellectual property for basketball and says, you need to sign an end user license agreement to play this game, right? And oh, by the way, I could change the rules of this game whenever I want, and you can't actually play the game in another way. In the United States, the big traditional sports leagues also have government protection from competition. And while esports don't have that level of anti competitive security, ownership of the intellectual property rights of the game still keeps control in the hands of the publishers. Meaning technically, the publisher could tell anyone running an unauthorized tournament to stop playing their game. Obviously, it's a great deal for whoever is running the league, whoever is selling these franchise spots. But it does presume that they will have a great deal of value down the road. And that's where things get sticky, because in some ways, this model is unproven. You can create something that looks like a traditional sport, but have you created any of the infrastructure, any of the ground level enthusiasm, the cultural cachet that traditional sports have that enable this model to work? Probably not. You've created a scale model, a very expensive one. But have you created the thing itself? How does a company like Blizzard make money off of esports? Esports is seen largely as a marketing vehicle for the sale of games or for the sale of in-game content within those games. It's hard to say right now whether esports itself as a facsimile of traditional sports, which you know is driven by advertising and media and sponsorship, is, is going to make a lot of money right now. What is clear is that the game industry itself, including titles that are competed as esports titles, is making lots of money um, and doing quite well. Um, and so maybe esports as a functioning system is not the profitable part, game still is. One game that didn't make a lot of money was Blizzard's multiplayer online battle arena title, Heroes of the Storm, or HOTS. The game had a dedicated fan base, not quite as big as Blizzard's landmark game, Overwatch, but they invested money into developing the scene, even running a professional tournament series built around the game called Heroes Global Championship. Well, for a while. Then in 2019, just three years after the game launched, Blizzard canceled the tournament without warning, effectively killing competitive HOTS forever. HGC has been canceled, and it's some hot bullshit. Colin had been playing Heroes of the Storm since it was in beta. After putting years into the game, he landed a job with the US esports team Tempo Storm as their HOTS coach. It was an amazing time working with that team, and it felt like we were kind of growing in importance within the esports ecosystem, and, and that was all really cool. Tournaments were being hosted at bigger and bigger places, and it was just it was becoming more and more like the esports dream and it kept growing and growing and growing until HGC got caught by Blizzard in late 2018. What does something like the failure of Heroes of the Storm do to the esports ecosystem? Well, it can be costly both at the top and at the bottom. Um, you know, at the top, um, for anyone uh, who invested in it, it becomes a, a loss that maybe you can't recover from. It is also tremendously difficult for the fans who have been that support structure on the bottom. When a very popular game dies, it has a tremendous impact on um, the people who have built their cottage industry or their fandom around that. It's absolute bullshit. It's so awful. 
and now it's just all gone. The game is irrelevant. If there's no competitive scene, there's no league, then the game's just dead. Like it's absolutely awful. This is so terrible. I can't believe that they did this. What was happening to individual players when, the, when this yeah, happened? Yeah, there are players who put their life on hold or some people were dropping out of school to, to do this because it, it was actually like their big break. My memory isn't the greatest when it comes to this sort of stuff because it's traumatic for me. And I know that might sound kind of corny for people, but trauma comes in all different shapes and sizes and losing this much that I've worked so hard for actually created like a lot of memory loss for me. Do you think that a publisher should be involved with the league? No. Really? Uh, yes and no. Nine times out of 10, I would say that the publisher interferes with the game in a negative way. And I don't necessarily think that's the publisher's fault entirely. I think it just stems down to how businesses work, like them having to satisfy their shareholders and not actually be able to do all of the things that they want to do sometimes. But solely because they can have the power to just remove the jobs of hundreds of people, I think that, like, yeah, it's it's a bit of a problem. What do you think Blizzard should have done? If it was exclusively a financial issue, there was a lot of fixes to that. If it was a structure issue, um, there was fixes to that. The one thing Blizzard shouldn't have done was pull the plug. What they should have done is cared about people's lives and people's livelihoods and people's, um, you know, careers and people's heart and soul that they like poured into for years and years and the community that they owed a lot to actually, they should have cared about those people. I'm sorry that all that shit happened and I'm sorry that I left the game because people are still asking me like to this day, like, will I come back and stuff like that. and. And I'm not going to ever come back. Man, this, I'm not gonna lie to you, man. This sounds like a scary business to be in. A little bit, but I trust the future. And I think that if I continue to work hard, that great things will happen. I love it too much to go anywhere. I, I was here from the beginning and I'm going to be here until my end. I want to talk about the flip side. Publishers are definitely making a lot of money on this, and it seems like a pretty good proposition for them. Are they risking anything by getting involved in esports? There can be some risk, um, for sure. You don't know what title is going to be a hit, and that's a, that's a definite risk for people who are going to be investing energy in building a sports ecosystem, including live events, travel, prize pools. Winner of this match already guaranteed $1 million. All this risk and instability has led to a lot of experts who study the esports industry to question who's actually making money here and whether a lot of this might just be hype. Over the last few years, we've seen teams go from worth 17, 16, 18 million dollars to being worth 300, 400, 500 million dollars. But in the end, they're right now they're only making the top teams are making, you know, 17 to 22 million dollars in annual revenue. And some of those are still not making a profit. As things started taking off, you would see reports that would put the valuation of esports just like through the roof. And at the same time, I think many of us knew, you know, behind the scenes, people were often still struggling to make a living. There was still a lot of precarity. So I think the bubble conversation comes from sometimes this sense that the kind of public facing valuations and reports feel a little bit uh, a aspirational. To a degree, everything is fine in esports as long as the possibility exists that all these investments can make good. The minute its backers stop believing that, then what you have is a bubble and it will begin to explode. And the money that funds people's salaries, the money that funds the production of these lavish tournaments will begin to evaporate. When I think about who might be left behind, I do worry that some of all that investment wealth <laughs> is not fully trickling down to all of the folks who are aspirational, who now kind of want to work in this space that's been hyped up, that everybody says is worth a lot of money. Because if it really is worth as much as everybody says, then even the folks at the furthest end downstream should be getting a piece of that pie. We're now going to break some of this down with the Reset Roundtable. Join me this time as Waypoint Senior Editor Rob Zachney and gaming documentarian Phil Nolan. Hey guys. There's there's so much to cover here, but the, the first thing I want to get into is that a lot of people are still in this, in this sort of mode where we feel like we need to legitimize 
games and we need to legitimize specifically esports. Just oh no, it's not just people screwing around. There's people making money, and and there's people who take this very seriously. When I when I think about the potential for esports to evolve, I think historically there's been a lot of fixation on this notion that it needs to break through. It needs to get mainstream recognition, and a lot of times. Across media, mainstream has been recognized as boomers, as older, more established adults. And I think one of the things that's going to change the dynamic around that is simply that these generations are getting older. Uh, middle age is creeping up on millennials. And so to a degree, just, oh, just father time is winning this fight for esports. But I think esports has historically been kind of fixated on this notion that it does need mainstream legitimacy so that you could get people who watch golf. I think one of the dreams might be, imagine Jim Nance calling esports. There it is, a win for the ages. I personally can't imagine anything worse but I think in esports, that was kind of a dream that in some <laughs> fashion was being chased. I mean, yo, there is a lot of money being poured into esports right now. There's no question about it. Is this a bubble? I think the, the, the short answer is yes, and the long answer is just like yes with like five or six more S's. Ultimately, like, <laughs> we, we haven't seen, we haven't seen the, the profit that everyone's been gassing us up for, right? Like. It's been like a, almost a decade of this. Esports is this billion dollar, uh, super exciting speculative business. And that rhetoric hasn't changed in five years of very rapid and aggressive esports development and speculative investment. It's been years and we're still saying, oh, it's right around the corner. Next year's the year, boom. It's become a very real ecosystem full of work and opportunity, but under that hood, it might just be hot air. It might like there's a lot of games that have just bet on a return in the future that hasn't we don't see it yet, you know? If you say is esports a bubble, I think I would probably say no, actually, because I think what you're talking about is a series of bubbles. Some aren't bubbles at all. There there are some scenes I think that are perfectly healthy and operating at a reasonably sustainable um, level. But then there are a lot of games that have really pursued an aggressive growth and development strategy that I'm not sure I see the outcome super clearly. And I think one of the examples of that is a new model that's kind of taken root in esports in the last few years, uh, which is a franchise league model. This is something that League of Legends and Overwatch League both embraced. What was really interesting about Overwatch League is Overwatch was a very young game. It hadn't really proven how long its legs were. Like in terms of competitive shooters, these are games that their lifetime is measured over several years, ideally, not several months. Yeah. Overwatch League was a huge hit. And from the jump, they never even considered a grassroots driven model. That was never on the table. Blizzard went to a franchise model that looked a lot like a little mini NBA. And was that a deal that made sense for anyone but Blizzard? I tend to be a little bit skeptical. Did it make a better esport? Did it make a better competitive game? Did it hold audience interest? I think all of that has proven a little bit dubious uh, when it comes to this value proposition. And I think that that story is common through a lot of esports. What I worry about with Overwatch League is just kind of the the risk for everyone in the esports like system that Overwatch League creates. Because if this very ambitious franchise structure with a lot of outside money and very major investors doesn't work out and those investors are upset and alienated, um, that is the pool of capital from which all of esports is going to draw and it will be diminished because those people will want nothing to do with esports in general if, if this doesn't work out, you know? What would a sustainable grassroots approach to esports even look like? I think sustainability right now as we would know it would look a lot more like what competitive gaming has traditionally been. Small groups of people, uh, smaller communities, slightly more raw production values. But a lot of other games really did embrace this more speculative, more cash-rich esports model. 
And I think there's a lot of reluctance to imagine what life after that money drying up or uh, the speculation maybe tamping down salaries. I think there's a hesitation to look at what a sustainable reality might truly be. Could one big game messing it up? Could that just be the thing that has those ripple effects throughout the entirety of esports, where a lot of investors just start pulling out and say, you know what? This is not a good move. We're not putting money into this. I think the thing that esports has going for it is that for the scale that a lot of these outside investors operate operate at, esports is still a fairly small investment. When you're talking about the kind of billionaires who are behind NBA and NFL franchises, uh, a lot of whom have bought stakes in LCS franchises, in Overwatch League franchises. And so I think the weird thing is, even if it's a bubble, a lot of the people who have a stake don't really care if it's a good investment because it's like keeping a lottery ticket magneted to your fridge. Like, who cares? So I think from that standpoint, all you need to be able to do is continue telling a story about the bright future of esports and the potential for what is coming. Once people stop totally buying into that vision, I think esports will probably have a problem. What happens to the athletes? What happens to the people who actually, the labor? What happens to them if things go bad? I mean, it's not a fantastic plan B, but I know a lot of players will kind of go to Twitch whenever things go awry. Like they'll kind of try and like get their streaming career off the ground, pivot to some kind of influencer like presence. Depending on what game you're playing, a player might simply shift games. Your average e-athlete's career length, even in the most optimal circumstance, isn't more than a few years, maybe a decade tops. While they do really need to maximize their potential in that tiny window, um, there are there's more than one way to do that if they're willing to pivot or develop their skill set as a streamer or something like that. Uh, this isn't the PGA we're talking about, where you can be, you know, the 30th best golfer in the world and be rich as hell. You know, if you are not the best at StarCraft, you are not making good money. If you're just the second best at StarCraft, you're doing okay, but you're constantly kind of looking over your shoulder. What has COVID done to esports? Is this something that, that esports in general is going to be able to get through with no problem? They, they've had like a very legitimate opportunity with COVID. I know a lot of games viewership had gone up, especially early, um, uh, during times in the summer where people are normally outside doing whatever they want, gamers included, um, there was none of that. And instead people would turning to Twitch more and turning to streamers and turning to the esports. The standard play wasn't really inhibited by COVID. It was just like, there wasn't an arena full of people. I would just throw out one thing though. I think in some ways, I would have expected esports to have more of a moment than it has under COVID. One of the funny things is that in esports for years, there has been this emphasis on the only real tournament is a LAN tournament, right? Like online tournaments tend to be looked down upon, both because they introduce elements of uh, lag and internet connection quality issues that can affect quality of play, uh, can affect players' abilities to compete. And so in general, esports, built up a greater stigma against running remote events, even though they have the capacity to do that kind of organically. Um, if I can give you a counterpoint to a, a scene that kind of blew up out of nowhere, when COVID hit, it was right on the eve of the motorsports season. And suddenly all motorsports dried up overnight. So one of the things you saw happen was iRacing, which is just a super nerdy, intense, um, like peak dad energy uh, racing sim that the people play online, subscription only. They have rules. If you drive like a jerk in iRacing, they will throw you out of the race. They will pull this car over. It's a very serious like online racer. They started running events uh, with professional motorsports athletes. Welcome to the Infra Presents the Firecracker 400. I'm your host, David Schildhaus. They had no tradition of sweating things like how are we going to run a live event? How are we going to have a LAN? So having a reality where everyone is just remoting in and driving races together and just kind of letting it ride in terms of lag or connection quality made for some really remarkable events and created a lot of like enduring interest in that. And I think that's an interesting contrast to what happened in a lot of esports where COVID affected them almost as much as traditional sports at first. 
On that note, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. Rob, Phil, thanks so much for being with me. Thanks, Dexter. Thanks, Dexter. For you, thanks so much for hanging out. And there's a lot more to talk about next time on Reset, the unauthorized guide to video games.